God. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for the faithfulness of your children here and everywhere, eager to study, eager to learn, eager to obey. We are praying, Lord, your reward, the faithfulness of your people in Jesus' name. We are asking, Lord, that tonight you open the pages of the scriptures and give us vision, revelation, insight, understanding, and the willingness to be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Everyone, fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, children and young people, everyone listening to your word, concentrating on what Christ, the Savior, the Lord, has to say to each one. And we pray, Lord, we'll so honor you and listen to you and respond to you so that eternal life will be ours for everyone in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to take seriously the revelation you are giving us so that we'll not gamble with our lives, we'll not gamble with eternity, and we'll not gamble with the grace that you have provided for everyone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church of God said, Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. A few weeks ago, we began the study of the epistle of Paul to the Galatians. And we've gone through chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. Today, we're coming to verse 17, all through to the end of the chapter. Look at that. In Galatians chapter 1, Verse 17, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. But it says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Verse 19, but other of the apostles saw so I none, save James, except James, the Lord's brother. Verse 20 tells us, Now, the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Verse 21, Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and then in verse 22, and was unknown by faith unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. 23 then tells us, but, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. Verse 24, and they glorified God in me and they glorified God in me. His life had turned around and the people saw that and the people could recognize the change, the transformation and the supernatural hand of God upon his life and they glorified God in me. He had been persecuting. Now he's preaching that same gospel that he persecuted before and they glorified God in me. His life was lived in the dungeon of sinfulness. But now the power of God and the strength of the Lord and the salvation of God had come to him. If any man, if any boy, if any girl, if any brother, if any sister, if anyone in any church, if anyone in any age be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and the old lifestyle is gone, and behold, all things have become new. And the people that saw him, they knew the old life. 
they saw the new life and they glorified God in me. He had manifested zeal and earnestness in the persecution of the church, in the persecution of men and women. He had manifested zeal and the earnestness in working for the devil. Now he is converted and he brought all his skill, all his time and every understanding he had. He brought everything now to the preaching of the gospel. He had done much evil and if he could in the new life in the converted life in the regenerated life it would reverse every evil thing he had done if he could it will get to all the places he had forced people to blaspheme he'll get there he'll get to the kings he'll get to the leaders he'll get to the Israelites he'll get to the Jews he'll get to the Gentiles and he will reverse all the evil he had done he had some so much love for God and so so much excitement that God had given him another chance and then he so lived that life and he so practiced his faith that the people that saw him and the people that saw his actions now and the people that saw his activities now and the people that saw the manifestation of practical purposeful righteousness now knowing he was now walking and serving the Lord in view of eternity those people they glorified God in him and he tells us that all this happened to him so that for you and for me who are living in this generation he'll be a pattern that our lives too will so change our lives too will so be transformed our lives too we so experience the grace of God that the people who knew us before in our immediate family, the people who knew us before in our places of work, the people who knew us before in our schools, in our colleges, the people and the teenagers who were our peers and they knew us before and now they know that salvation has come, regeneration has come, a new life has come. They will look at us and see us and glorify God in us. The people who had been preaching to us before and we persecuted them and we neglected them and we rubbished all their message. Now conversion has come, a new life has come and those people that were preaching to us before, they see the light. They see the glory, they see the manifestation of the salvation of the Lord, and they say, thank God we didn't give up on him, thank God we didn't give up on her, and they glorify God in me. That's what we're looking at tonight, the transformation of a great persecutor to a gracious preacher. Persecutor, preacher, great persecutor, became a gracious preacher. The transformation, the change, the supernatural turnaround of a great persecutor to a gracious preacher. There are three things we're looking at as we look at these verses today. Number one, the testimony of a truly converted soul. A truly converted soul, not just a bench woman, not just somebody coming to church, not just somebody hearing the word and not praying about it, not doing anything about it. The people that come and they give their lives to the Lord, they have conviction. And then they go to pray. And there is a great manifestation of the grace of God in their lives, their testimony. And your testimony, if you are born again, whether you are a teenager, you are a boy, you are a girl, you are a man, you are a woman, when somebody gets converted, anyone, anytime, anywhere, there is a testimony, the testimony of a truly converted soul. Number two is the truthfulness of a trustable cleansed says when we come to the lord it cleanses us it washes us it says so was some of you but now ye are washed but now ye are sanctified but now ye, you are converted and because you are converted now 
you're truthful, you are trustable, and your words are trustworthy. You are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. The truthfulness of a trustable cleansing. Number three, is the transformation of a teacher, Christ-centered, a teaching, Christ-centered servant. He became not only saved, called to salvation, not only sanctified, called to sanctification, he became a servant of God. We are saved to serve. Have you started serving? Are you serving the Lord in love with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? Are you bringing all your skill, all your energy without any reservation and without any rival? Are you bringing all your skill and all your strength, everything you've got, all your talent? Are you bringing that to serve the Lord? If you are born again, if you are converted, if you are saved, if your life has been grieved by the grace of God and you are turned around, one purpose and one pursuit and one thing in which you persevere the service of the Lord for the glory of God, for the conversion of souls that you understand, I am saved to serve and that day is lost when you do not do something that promotes the service of the Lord, that promotes people from sin, from sin to saintliness, that hour, that moment, that day is lost, that you don't bring out the purpose of your salvation, that you are saved to serve. And so Paul the Apostle, he understood, he received grace that he might reveal that grace to other people. He came into the kingdom that he, by his endeavor and by his work, may bring other people into the kingdom, saved to serve. That appeared to be his motto. And he saw that everywhere. He saw it on the street. I'm saved to serve. He saw it in the community. I'm saved to serve. He saw it in the prison. I am saved to serve. He saw it everywhere he went. And that was the motor that drove him, that made him to understand because I am saved to serve. Every opportunity I'm going to make use of, and I will not allow any opportunity to pass without the service of God, the transformation of a teaching Christ-centered servant. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the testimony of a truly converted soul. Truly, genuinely, veritably converted unto the Lord. It tells us in Galatians chapter 1, verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then in verse 18, it says, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Verse 19 says, It says, But other of the apostles saw I none save except James, the Lord's brother. The testimony, he was giving testimony of what happened when he knew the Lord. After he knew the Lord, and years after he came to the Lord, the testimony of a truly converted and truly saved soul. Three things there. Number one, the early period of his com conversion and conviction. The early period, if you are truly saved, if you are genuinely saved, you remember the good old days, the first day when you came to know the Lord, the joy and the peace and the new purpose and the new drive of your life and the new commitment of your life and the new love and the fellowship we had at that time. You have the testimony of the early period of your conversion and conviction. The question is, as you remember, as you recall, is it still like that today? Do you still have the same joy and the same peace 
and the same purpose and the same driver that you had at that time that should be the testimony for Paul the Apostle the early conversion life was not anything different from the present day that now he was giving the testimony number two the evident purpose of connection and consultation he went to see Peter why he went to see James, the brother of uh, Jesus, of the Lord in the flesh. Why? The purpose, the evident purpose of connection and consultation. After you are born again, you don't stay as an isolated island. You connect with other believers. You connect with a Bible believing church. What's the purpose? Why are you connected to a Bible believing church? Why are you connected to the Bible study? Why are you connected to the people of God who love the Bible, know the Bible, and follow the Bible? There must be an evident purpose in your life why that connection consultation is there. Number three the established pillars in the church of Christ established pillars that he consulted the people he met with and their pillars in the church there was the time there were babes and babes are not strong babes are not solid but they continue in the Lord and it is that continuity in the Lord Continuity in the word of God, continuity in prayer, continuity in facing every challenge that came to them as believers that made them stronger and stronger and stronger. And eventually they became pillars and they could be consulted. And people could go to them because they are solid, steadfast, unshakable pillars in the church of Christ. Let's look at number one, the early period of his conversion and conviction. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. That's exactly the idea. That's exactly the notion. That's exactly the principle. That's exactly the precept. That's exactly the word he had been fighting. But now, instead of fighting that, he became born again. The Lord Jesus has spoken unto him on the way to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. Jesus, who could not persecute us, it is hard for thee to kick against the priests. He said, Lord, what must I do now? Go to Damascus, it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. And it was there three days and, and uh, three days and three nights, just praying uh, unto the Lord. And then Ananas came to him, uh, he had been converted, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you on the way to Damascus has sent me that your eyes will be opened, uh, that you'll be baptized in water and also filled with the Holy Ghost. And that happened. And because of that, when he saw that, Christ, the Son of God, Christ, the very Savior of the world, he began to preach and straightway he preached that Christ is the Son of God in the synagogue. And we're told in verse 21, in verse 21, it tells us about this same Saul and the activity that went on and the program and the project that went on as he was preaching the gospel and then persecution arose. That persecution, when it arose, the people in Damascus, they knew that this persecution was because of this new life. And now he tells us in verse 21, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verse 21, but all that had him, they were amazed, amazed at the conversion, amazed at the turning around, amazed at the grace of God that came to his life now. All that heard him, young and old, all that had him, the believers and the unbelievers, all that had him were amazed and said, is not this he, Saul, 
that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither that for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest then in verse 22 it tells us and Saul increased the more in strength as I said, when you are converted, you're a new babe in Christ. And then uh, he was praying. He was studying the scriptures. He was looking at everything he had needs. How foolish he was. He thought to himself that he could find an obvious truth. The Redeemer and the Savior. And because of that, he gave himself to prayer. And we're told he increased the more in strength. He was strong when the Lord spoke to him. He was strong when he became converted. He was strong when he got saved. But now, day by day, and week after week, all the time he spent in Damascus there, he was getting stronger, and he, co he confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. No shadow of doubt in his mind. No shadow of doubt in his presentation. He was telling them, this is the very Christ. And then in verse 23, we're told, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. He was so effective. The presentation of the word, the pursuance of the salvation of other people and the commitment in, the, in which he devoted himself day and night and every day with the new seal, with the new love, and with the new commitment. The way he did it, he said, if this man continues like this, he'll turn the world upside down. True, true. Because when you come later, they said, the men that have turned the world upside down are come thither also so the Jews took counsel to kill him then we were told in verse 24 it says and their laying a dead laying in which was known of Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him even though the persecution arose to that level he wasn't afraid, but look at what the brethren did in verse 25. In verse 25, and then the disciples took him by night, and they let him down by the wall in a basket. That was the beginning because of his conviction, because of his conversion, the early period of his coming to the Lord. I'm asking you the question, do you, can you refer to such early period in your Christian life? A change, a transformation so dramatic that your friends and your neighbors and everyone knew about that kind of conversion? Did you ever have conviction that drove you to your knees, that made you to say, Oh Lord, you are a sinner and you needed to be saved? Did that change happen? Did that transformation happen? Was that salvation given to you? And can you testify of that great change in the early part of your Christian life? And now, as that change continued, are you strengthened? Are you moving on? Are you growing in that conviction? Are you growing in that conversion experience? Let's look at number two there. Number two is the evident purpose of connection and consultation. He said he connected with Peter. He connected with James. Eventually, why did you do that? Look at Galatians chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 2. Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 2. And I went up by revelation. I went up by revelation. Now Paul the apostle in his life, after he became converted, he will go anywhere, everywhere by 
revelation because in the past i feel like no you wouldn't do that, do that again i think that no not by personal thought you wouldn't do that again the people want me to know not by the decision of the people difficulties are there dangers are there i cannot go now. no his life was not a kind of rotating around what people wanted what people did not want by revelation and i went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. He said, the reason I did this is to tell them, look at what I'm preaching. I'm preaching repentance towards God. Is that right? I'm preaching faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that right? I'm preaching that if any man comes to Christ, his life will become totally new. And the things he used to do, he'll do them no more. And the things he used to drink, he'll drink them no more and the clothes he used to wear he'll wear them no more Peter that's what I've been preaching is that right the purpose of the consultation is to reveal to the apostles in Jerusalem that this is what I have been preaching I communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles and but privately to them which were of reputation the people that had reputation that they had been preaching the gospel before him they knew the word they knew the purpose of Christ dying on the cross of Calvary and he came to them now he consulted he said this is what I do among the Gentiles you have not been there with me is this recognized by heaven? Is this approved of you who live with Christ and you are with him face to face? Will this be rewarded in eternity? When I cross over to the other side, he wanted to know so that he will not labor in vain. Do you ever compare notes with other people? Do you ever think with other people or do you just say, this is who I am? And this is what I do. And what I do, I do. It doesn't matter what other people think. All the people that have gone before me, it doesn't matter what they think. This is what I do. Uh -uh. Somebody wants to get to heaven is not so much opinionated like that. Isolated like that. It's connected. Am I doing right? Am I serving right? Am I going the right direction? Am I preaching the right thing? He consoles. And if in your life you are that independent, in your life you are self-willed, in your life you are isolated, in your life you don't care what other people who have gone before you, what they do or what they say or what they think, you might not be rewarded when you get over there. You are not exposing your mistakes. You are not exposing your life. You are not exposing your service. You are not exposing your ministry to be looked at, analyzed, evaluated, to see whether you are right or wrong. But Paul the Apostle said, I went up by revelation. And I communicated to them that preach the gospel before me and what I'm preaching among the Gentiles privately to them which were of reputation lest by any means I shall run or I'd run in vain lest by any means I shall run or I'd run in vain he expects that of you and that of me that you sit down that you sit back and think about what you do, how you serve, how you live, how you do in your family, how you interact with your companions and with people around you so that on the final day, the things that should have been corrected, which had not been corrected, will then make you to face a bleak, empty, 
regrettable future. Look at Philippians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 16. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of life. The word that brings other people to life. Not the word of death. The word of discouragement. Holding forth not anything that will kill the zeal and the enthusiasm of other people, but the word you hold forth. Like Paul the Apostle, holding forth the word of life, the word that brings other people to life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not drawn in vain, neither labored in vain. Look at number three here. Number three is the established pillars in the church of Christ. The established pillars in the church of Christ. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 8. Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 8, is not going to talk about the pillars. The pillars he consulted so that he will know if I measure what I do as a pilgrim with what the pillars of the church, what he do? If I measure if I evaluate my message, my manner of life, my ministry, what the ministry and the message and manner of life of the pillars in the church of the living God, I know whether I am straight or I'm bent or I am not doing right. That's what we need to do now. If you draw a line, you measure that line, whether that line, that line is straight or crooked, by a ruler. And that ruler is straight, that's the standard. And Paul, the apostle, wanted to do that. He said in Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And then it says in verse 9, in verse 9, And when James and Peter, Severus, and John, who seemed to be pillars, those three apostles, you could measure what you were doing, your ministry, your message, your manner of life, your motivation, your motive. You could measure who you are with them. And it said, James, Severus, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. He didn't say, I don't care the comment of anyone. I don't care the evaluation of anyone. I don't care what Peter thinks, what James thinks, what, um, what John thinks, but he said, they perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision so that there were two kinds of people on earth the circumcision and the uncircumcision the Jews and the Gentiles and they covered the area of the Jews and he covered the area of the Gentiles so that everyone in the world can hear the saving gospel the sanctifying gospel the supernatural gospel that leads us from where we are to where we ought to be, our eternal destiny. We come now to point number two. Point number two is the truthfulness of trustable, cleansed, saved. It tells us in Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 1, verse 20. Now, the things 
which I write unto you. Behold, before God, I lie not. As a Christian, converted, cleansed, no more a sinner, but a saint, the things I say before God, I lie not. The things I write before God, I lie not. The church I put on WhatsApp before God, I lie not. The text I send to anyone before God, I lie not. What I tell the children, my children, or anybody's children, before God, I lie not. What I tell my colleagues, what I show unto other people, before God, I lie not. Salvation takes lying away from our heart, because actually it comes from the heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the heart, the hand writes. Out of the heart, the members of the body, the act. And we don't, we don't treat in lies anymore. The one who lives in us is the way and the truth and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father except by him. And so... Paul the Apostle, in his testimony, he gave the truthfulness of a trustable, trustworthy, clear says, Now, the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Then in verse 21, he tells us afterward, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. What did I take there? The same truth and truthfulness that I have since I became born again. I didn't modify. I didn't adulterate it. I didn't do anything to deceive anyone. I'm raised up for the salvation of the Gentiles and the heathen. And lies will not save anybody. Whatever you make somebody to do, by deception, by lying, will not save them, will not strengthen them, will not equip them, will not help them to move on in the things of God. If you want to lift up people, if you want to get people saved, if you want to get people standing steadfast, it's the truth that lifts up people, it's the truth that makes people to move forward in progress look at three things here number one saying the truth in christ with clear conscience saying it saying the truth uttering the truth declaring the truth in christ with clear conscience number two standing for truth like christ without cowardly compromise when somebody tells a lie is because he is a coward. He wants to pass across a message. He doesn't have the boldness and the courage to say, my brother, my sister, my friend, my neighbor, this is the way. This is the expectation. And so he has to cover and color what he says and compromise and pass across something which is not the absolute truth. Standing in for truth like Christ without cowardly compromise. Number three, sharing the truth. That's the only thing you share. If you want people saved, if you want people sanctified, if you want people strengthened, if you want people steadfast, if you want people committed and going in the way of life eternal, if that is your goal to help people and prepare them for heaven, this is the only thing to share, sharing the truth of Christ without corrupt conversation. Let's look at them one by one. Number one is saying the truth in Christ with clear conscience. It says in Galatians chapter 1 verse 20, now the things which I write unto you 
behold, before God, before God, he was conscious of God everywhere he was, with whomsoever he might be relating. He said, before God, I lie not. There are people who leave their God in church. And when they go out of the church building, they live as if God cannot hear, God cannot see, God cannot write and keep a record of what they're doing. But Paul the Apostle said, in the temple, in the sanctuary, on the street, in the community, in the prison, under persecution, with friends, with foes and enemies, I know God is always there. So, whatever I do, whatever I say, whatever I write, behold, before God, I lie not. That takes genuine salvation. Look at Romans chapter 9, reading from verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. If somebody is going to tell a lie, he has to be outside Christ. You cannot be in Christ, enveloped in Christ, baptized in Christ, immersed in Christ, living in Christ, walking in Christ, abiding in Christ, and trade with lie or deception. Because if you are in Christ, is the truth personified. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing the witness, bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That's how we live as children of God. That you know you are in Christ and the Holy Ghost is bearing witness with your conscience and the conscience, if the conscience is not dead or deadened by habitual lying, habitual deception, the conscience will alert you and say, is that the truth? Are you living a lie? Are you still in Christ? Did you have to come outside Christ because you want to gain something by lying, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. I pray that that same attitude and that same disposition of mind will be upon every one of us in Jesus' name. Look at number two there. Number two is standing for truth, like Christ, without cowardly compromise. Standing, standing. The whole world lies in the wicked one. There is deception all over in the world. And people expect you to corroborate to support, to defend, to cover up their lying because that's their lie. And then they might even tell you now, I said such and such to so and so. If he happens to check off from you, cover me, defend me, say the same thing, tell the same lie, that have told him, some people, that's how they administer their lives. Some people, that's how they do their work. Some people, that's how they build a shield, shelter around them so that nobody will be able to penetrate and people will leave them the way they are. If they continue like that in deception and lying, guess where they're going to spend eternity on the other side because no liar gets to heaven. But Paul the Apostle said, I stand. I stand for the truth like Christ without cowardly compromise, 
might land him in jail, might land him in serious persecution, but all the same, prison imprisonment is not forever. It's our light affliction for this present time. Eternity is longer. Let me put it this way. Your destiny outweighs your history. All that happens here, that's history. That's story. It will soon end. But your destiny, if you put everything on scale, what you've done, what happens on earth, that's history. And then on the other side of the scale, destiny. And that destiny outweighs your history. That's the, that's the reason why he was always looking up, looking at those things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. And the things which are not seen, they are eternal. Because of that, it's only the truth that he walked with. I pray that will be your life. I can't hear my people. No lying. No deception. No hypocrisy. You are just the way you are. If you are righteous, you'll always be the way you are. If you are converted, you'll be the way you are. If you are committed to heaven, committed to righteousness, committed to the truth, you're all the, you're all the same the way you are. There'll be no need to tell a lie. There'll be no need to stand for something corrupt. There'll be no need for cowardly compromise. You'll be standing for the truth like Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 22 and reading from verse 16. Matthew 22, verse 16. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and that thou teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of man. That's your life like Christ. Christ never had anything in his nature, in his heart, in his life that want to bend the truth a little be acceptable to the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians, and the people knew. And they said, we know. Can they say that about you? A follower of Christ, a child of God, we know that thou art true. Anything coming out of you, any word, any attitude, any utterance, any body language, everything thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, even men that are plotting and planning to persecute and crucify you, neither carest thou for any man. They couldn't do anything against Christ that the heavenly father has not ordained. And he said, all things that are written concerning me will be fulfilled. And Pharisees could not change that. Sadducees could not change that. Herodians could not change that. Because of that, he cared not for any man, and thou regardest not the person of Man. Let's come to number two here. Number three. In number three, we're talking about sharing the truth of Christ without corrupt conversation. Sharing the truth of Christ without corrupt conversation. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Reading from verse 21, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in 
Jesus. That's what makes the difference. If you have been taught by him, taught on salvation, as the truth of salvation is in Christ. If you have been taught by him, taught for sanctification, as the truth is in Christ. If you have been taught by him as to marriage, the marriage of the believer, one man, one wife, until death do us part, as the truth is in him. If you have been taught by him in righteousness, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. But blessed are they that do thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you have been taught that truth as the truth is in Christ, it says, Behold, I come quickly, and he said, as it happened in the time of Noah, they were eating and drinking, and they knew not when the flood came, so shall it be at the time when the Son of Man shall come. He can come in the night, or in the day, or at any time, suddenly, as when you were not expecting, and at midnight, behold a cry, the bridegroom cometh. If you have been taught that truth, and the truth is in Christ, you want to live plain. You want to live clear. You want to live saved, sanctified, righteous. If you have been taught by him as the truth is in Christ. He tells us in verse 22 there, in verse 22, that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws. Verse 23, verse 23 says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, it says that she put on the new man, saved new man, sanctified new man, steadfast in the Lord new man, that she put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And then in verse 25, it says, wherefore, putting away lying, Put it far away from you, as the east is far from the west. Put it away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. We'll come to point number three now. Point number three, the transformation of a teaching Christ-centered servant. Here was now the servant of God. And here is the transformation we find in his life. Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 22. And was unknown, he was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Churches in Christ. The church or the churches saved, converted, by Christ, sanctified, made holy, made righteous by Christ. Churches baptized into Christ. He said he wasn't known unto them, unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Verse 23 says, but they had heard only. They had heard. They had heard. They had heard there's no secret under the sun. If we are converted, they will hear. Even where we have not been, our classmates, old classmates, they will hear. Old friends, they will hear. We have not seen them for decades now. They will hear. If somebody becomes a sinner, terrible sinner, he goes to court, is judged, is imprisoned. You cannot hide that. 
they will hear if somebody becomes a gambler and his life is now like the life of a ruffian they will hear in the case of paul they knew what he was before even the people that have not seen him for decades they heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which was he destroyed and then in verse 24 it says and be glorified God in me they didn't hang their heads in shame and say oh my what happened to that man it was a promising young man a promising young woman see what had happened to him see what had happened to her and then they want their children not to be like that man. But no, in the case of Paul, instead of hanging their head in sorrow and in shame, they lifted up their head unto the God of heaven. And they said, God, you can do this with a man who had gone so far in crime and so far in evil. And you have turned his life around and they glorified God. God in me, I pray your life will not be a shameful life. Your life will not be a sorrow to your parents, your physical, natural parents, and your spiritual parents. And when we hear of you, then we will look up to God who can so save a man, so save a woman that we knew him before, we knew her before, now we can glorify God in you. And then the church, where you are converted, they can hear about you, your life, they can even send spies to look at him, to look at her, and to follow you to places you might not even know the people are watching. And then they go back to the people that sent them and they'll say, that woman is for real. That man is for real. And the people who were instrumental to your salvation will glorify God in you. May that happen in your life. May that be pronounced in your life. That we and others we glorify God in you. Amen. Three things. Number one, a clear, indispensable conversion. Indispensable conversion recorded in heaven, noted in heaven, very clear. Number two, a cleansed, incorruptible conscience. Cleansed, incorruptible conscience. Three, a clean-hearted, indestructible consecration. Look at that man. From the day he was converted until the day he left this world, when he declared, I have fought a good fight. And he declared, I finished my course. And he declared, now, the crown of life is laid up for me not only for me but for all that love is appearing from the day commencement to the climax consummation his final day on earth it was consistent and you couldn't affect you couldn't destroy his consecration let's look at number one number one a clear indispensable conversion Already we've read that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 22. And then in Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 20. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. And straightway, straightway, immediately, instantaneously, without any delay, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God dramatically opposite what he used to say what he used to think but now 
a mighty change, an indisputable conversion, a change had come. That's the change that comes when we too are converted. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 9. Do ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, no adulterers, no effeminate, no abusers of themselves with mankind. A man and a man abusing themselves, messing up themselves. A woman and a woman, a lady and a lady abusing themselves and going into fleshly acts. It says, all those that abuse themselves with mankind. Then in verse 10, in verse 10, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners, none of them shall inherit the kingdom of God. But look at the conversion. Look at the indisputable conversion. In verse 11, it says, and such were in the past, and such were not her, and such were some of you. Adulterers in the past, fornicators in the past, thieves in the past, pugnacious, violent people in the past, and idolaters in the past, such were some of you. You were not candidates for the kingdom of God when you were like that. You wouldn't inherit the kingdom of God if you continue like that. But look at that. A change happens when you come to Christ. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. But now be made free from sin and become the servants to God. No more servants to the flesh. No more servants to self-will. No more servants to the world. No more servants to Satan. But now be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Number two now. Number two, the cleansed, incorruptible conscience. Cleansed, incorruptible conscience. It tells us in Psalm 51, verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. You desire truth, not deception. Not lie, not changing of the real thing and publicizing and proclaiming and telling other people the backside of the issue. Behold, God desires truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part that shall make me to know wisdom. That's wisdom. Hypocrisy is not wisdom. Telling a lie is not wisdom. Deception is not wisdom. Because deception is not the wisdom that will take you to heaven. Deception is the thing that makes you to go three steps backward after you've gone one step forward. Deception affects your salvation affects your sanctification whatever the reason you give for that deception but the wisdom which is of God is first pure 
and peaceable and incorruptible you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom it tells us in first timothy chapter 1 verse 5 first timothy chapter 1 reading from verse 5 it says now the end the goal the purpose the ultimate destination now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned, faith unpretended, faith without dissimulation. Let's come to number two there. Number number three. As we look at this, number three is talking about a clean hearted, indestructible consecration the consecration we have and the consecration paul the apostle had from the very beginning and he continued and continued and continued until the very end why because of the words of christ he that endureth unto the end the same shall be saved and christ is our confidence if we hold fast the beginning of our faith unto the very end it says the just shall live by faith but if any man draw back my soul shall not have pleasure in him but we are not of them that draw back unto perdition those who draw back from their salvation from their conviction, from their consecration, those who draw back, they draw back unto perdition. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but those who pursue, who persevere, who go on until the end. A clean-hearted, indestructible consecration. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 23. But... They had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth, now preacheth, first day now preacheth, first week now preacheth, and then the first year now preacheth. They imprisoned him, he came out of prison, now preacheth. He suffered shipwreck. He came out of the shipwreck. Now preaches. He suffered the misinterpretation and the pressure of false brethren. He came out of that. Now preaches. And then he came to the time when he said, The time of my departure is at hand. And so, Timothy, come quickly. Because you may not see me if you don't come quickly. But all the same, now preaches from the beginning to the end. A consecration that was indestructible that's what the Lord expects of us that will not grow cool and will not go dim will not go tired and our light will not go out in the middle of the way until the end your light will keep on shining in Jesus name because it says they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. And I pray that same grace that was available for Paul and for all his companions, that same grace will be available for you. For me. Look at Job. As we bring everything to a conclusion, Job chapter 17, verse 9. Job chapter 17, we're looking at verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way. If you are saved, the righteous also shall hold 
on his way. If you have been taught the truth, as the truth is in Christ, the righteous also shall hold on his way. If you have been made righteous, free from sin, and the blood of Christ has washed you and cleansed you, and you have committed yourself to the Lord unreservedly, the righteous also shall hold on his way. And he that is clean, that has clean hands, if the Lord has cleansed you by the washing of the water and by the washing of the blood of the Lamb, if we walk in the truth as he is in the truth, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. If you have been cleansed, Lord, who will go to the hill of the Lord and who will abide in his holy hill? They that have clean hands and a pure heart, those who have not lifted up their hearts unto vanity or deception. If you have been cleansed by the blood and you remain cleansed and consecrated, he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. Stronger and stronger. Say that's me. Say that's me. It will happen to you. Strong, stronger, stronger, stronger. You will not be wicked. You will not compromise. You will not turn back. You will not regret your consecrated life in Jesus' name shall be stronger and stronger. Where is the man? Where is the woman? Where are you? Tell the Lord, stronger and stronger. If you are saved, stronger and stronger. If you are not saved, you'll be rotting and rotting. If you are not saved, you'll be wobbling and wobbling. If you are not saved, you'll be compromising and compromising. If you are not saved, you'll be going from bad to worse. But if you are saved, if you are sanctified, if you are steadfast, you'll be stronger and stronger in the Lord. The righteous, made righteous by the death of Christ and by the sacrifice of Christ, the righteous also shall hold on his way. And he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord and let today, the study today, and your response to the study today and your prayer today move you forward and become stronger, stronger, stronger in the Lord.